Hello, my name is William Waterway, and today I'm going to present to you a new definition for our Earth's water cycle. This presentation is a continuation of the one that I gave at the International Symposium of Aquascience, Water Resources, and the Arts that was simulcast to 11 countries. I would like to give special thanks to NASA and the United States Geological Survey for the use of their illustrations. And also, I'd like to give thanks to MVTV for production assistance. The material I am presenting to you today is the first time in history that this new definition for the water cycle is being made available. The old definition for the water cycle only included one phase of the water cycle and is based on scientific data that is no longer updated. The new definition for the water cycle, which we call the waterway cycle, to differentiate it from the old, includes three interactive cycles, the cosmic water cycle, the atmospheric water cycle, and the oceanic water cycle. This new definition for the waterway cycle is based on current scientific research data. What you see behind me is the illustration that is presently used for Earth's water cycle. This illustration is based on the old definition of the water cycle that was first discovered and presented by a Frenchman named Bernard Policy in his book, Admirable Discourses. And basically what we all have been taught and what most of you understand represents the water cycle is that we have evaporation from the influence of the heat of the sun. And this evaporation goes up into the upper atmosphere where it gets cold and it condenses into clouds, sleet, snow, etc. And then we have precipitation, and then we have collection in surface waters, in vegetation, and in groundwater. And then this water goes back into the ocean and evaporates up into the atmosphere. And this is the circular fashion is why we call it the water cycle. The illustration you see behind me represents the oceanic cycle. Now, when I say oceanic cycle to my friends or to my peers in science, people look at me and they go, William, what is the oceanic cycle? Most people feel the oceanic cycle is basically the ocean as it cycles water around in its currents or when it evaporates up into the atmosphere. I said, no, no, the oceanic cycle is when all the water in the ocean, in all of Earth's oceans, gets pushed down and pulled down toward the core of the Earth. And then it's recycled underneath the ocean and comes back up and vents itself into the ocean and up into continents. And this is called the oceanic cycle. And it's influenced by the heat from the core of our Earth. So what we have learned is that as this water circulates from the ocean and down toward the core of the Earth, that this circulation pattern gives us a new ocean approximately every 7 million years. And you consider over billions of years, that is hundreds of times that our oceans have completely changed over and recycled themselves, about three to 400 times, maybe more. That is a significant contribution to influencing the water cycle. And that is why we include this, this new scientific data 
as part of the new definition of the waterway cycle. So to explain it further, what we have is from the depths of the ocean, from gravity, and from plate tectonics, plate tectonics, where the plates move around on the Earth. We have eight major plates and several smaller ones, but where they shift around on the mantle. And as they do so, what happens is the plate comes into contact with a continent and it subducts, we call it the zone of subduction. I like that term. And it pushes down underneath the continent, but as it does so, it is deeply saturated with water from the bottom of the ocean. So we see the bed of the ocean, the floor of the ocean, comes underneath a continent, it subducts, and as it does so, it carries ocean water with it down toward the core of the Earth, where it is superheated. And this superheated water creates magma by melting the rocks in the Earth's mantle. And this magma comes up in forms that we are familiar with, either it vents as a gas or comes up as a volcano. By the way, the plume from a volcano that you see here, this plume is made up mostly of water vapor from the oceanic water that was pushed up. And another thing that's very important to understand, that without this process, there would be no volcanoes on Earth. It takes superheated water to melt rock and to create magma and vent up the water that comes underneath the continent from this zone of subduction. And besides coming up underneath a continent, we also have this circulation pattern in the middle of our oceans. So here we have, the again, the ocean water that comes in here in the zone of subduction, gets circulated here through the core of the Earth, comes up here in what we call a mid-oceanic ridge, Every ocean in the world has this ridge, mid-oceanic ridge. And here it separates. So it comes together. You have the magma coming up. And it splits the ocean floor at the mid-oceanic ridge. And one part of the ocean, the plate here, goes in this direction toward another continent in that direction. And this plate here gets pushed toward another continent. So these two plates move away from each other. So this cycle, this cycle of water, oceanic water moving around under continents, this cycle of oceanic water moving underneath our oceans is what we call the oceanic cycle. And another very important point to understand is that here at these vents under the ocean, and this one here, where we have a volcano. And as you know, deep sea volcanoes end up sometimes creating an island, like the Hawaiian chain of islands. But at these vents under the ocean, we have forms of life called extremophiles. And they were only discovered 24 years ago by the submersible called Alvin from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And these life forms are unique in the world. And scientists believe that they're the first life forms to inhabit Earth. So in theory, without this process of the oceanic cycle, there is the potential that there could be no life on Earth, that we would have dead oceans, and possibly we would be a dead planet. So that is the contribution of the oceanic cycle to the overall waterway cycle. What you see behind me is a photograph from a satellite of our planet Earth. The first photograph taken of our planet from outer space was in 1946, which is why when we took this photograph, we realized how alone we are in this region of space as a planet with liquid water and with life, and it, which is why we call our planet the blue planet 
the water planet, or sometimes they call it the blue marble. But what we see here in this photograph is a thin aura. And that aura basically represents the atmosphere that we have that is held close to Earth by gravity and that protects us from the extremes of outer space, the extreme deep cold, and from ultraviolet rays from our sun, from meteors that may otherwise come to Earth and cause harm. So we have this layer of protection, this skin of protection of water vapor that is made up of the atmospheric water cycle that we reviewed earlier. What you see here is a photograph of the Leonid meteor shower. And certainly, it's one of the most prolific meteor showers that visit our planet. And you know that old saying about when you see a shooting star, you make a wish? Basically, shooting stars are meteors that we see skimming across the top of our atmosphere. And as you saw in the previous slide, it's that atmosphere that protects us from meteors from crashing to Earth. However, not all meteors are destroyed in our atmosphere. Some of them do penetrate and arrive on Earth, and when they do so, we call them meteorites. In 1999, in the state of Texas, a large meteorite landed. And a discovery was made in that meteorite that made headlines around the entire world. And that discovery was that in the heart of that meteorite, scientists from NASA discovered extraterrestrial water. Now, since then, of course, we've explored other meteorites and have discovered that within them, there is extraterrestrial water that is being delivered to our planet. Now, besides just being water from outer space that has been traveling for billions of years, the water inside the meteorites contain amino acids. And these amino acids are part of the foundation of life. They're, they form the nucleobases, which in turn lays the foundation for proteins and DNA. Now, there are also some other theories that are kind of scary in that we believe that these amino acids that are coming to Earth in what we call the cosmic rain are also delivering viruses. Are they are forming viruses once they are delivered here by mutating existing viruses. So these theories are now being explored. But certainly, we know that these influences from outer space also influence, potentially, the biodiversity of our planet. And besides delivering water to Earth, it was just two years ago, in 2009, that NASA discovered water in the polar regions of our moon. And it was only approximately 30 years ago that we discovered water in outer space. And for the very first time, and again, this made headlines around the world for the very first time, our minds opened up to the fact that water exists elsewhere in the universe besides Earth. And since then, we've discovered water in regions all throughout the universe as far back as almost 13 billion years ago, just after the dawn of our universe. So here we have meteorites bringing this water from the universe to our planet as cosmic rain, a very, very important part of the cosmic water cycle. Here we have a photograph of a comet as it flies through our solar system. All through humankind's history, there has been documentation of comets and their significance as they come through our solar system. 
We see artwork of comets and pictographs and petroglyphs around the world. We see them inside of caves. In the pyramids, we see drawings on the inside of the pyramids representing comets. And from the dawn of writing 5,000 years ago, as we started producing books, there are drawings of comets. And they're referred to at various times in history. And they felt that they were, in some way, forecasting events. Nostradamus talked about comets as well. The comets are scientifically made up of 80% water and 20% dust and dirt and rock, stone. This is why we call them dirty snowballs. The tail of a comet, what is visible to us, is approximately 15% dust that reflects light from the sun, and about 75% is water that we cannot see. And this tail of the comet is produced by the solar wind that hits the comet and creates the tail. And it's the same solar wind that hits our Earth and potentially takes away some of our atmosphere. Now, it has been guesstimated by scientists that over 100,000 billion dust particles from comets reaches the lower atmosphere of our Earth each year. And as this dust comes down into our atmosphere, we have the potential of raindrops forming around the comet dust and delivering the comet dust into our water cycle. Now, it also has been theorized <clears throat> that these raindrops carrying comet dust to Earth could also potentially carry, again, amino acids and nucleobases that could influence and alter the biodiversity on our planet Earth and could also introduce viruses that could cause illness to various life forms. Now, how did water arrive on Earth? Comets, we now believe, played a large part in delivering water to Earth. Over the relatively past, I'd say, the recent years and the past 10, 20 years, scientists have believed that water came to Earth through an outgassing of water after our planet began to solidify. However, just three months ago, there was a discovery made as Comet Hartley 2 went by our solar system. And what we discovered on Comet Hartley 2, and again, comets have water on them in the form of ice. And what they discovered on Comet Hartley 2 was that the water on Comet Hartley 2 exactly matched chemically the water of our oceans. This was the very first time in history that we discovered water on a comet that matched exactly with the water on our planet Earth. And this comet, Comet Hartley 2, came from a region of space that is very close to our solar system. Prior to that, all the comets that we analyzed with this new scientific technology showed us that the water on the comets was different than the chemistry of our oceans. So this three months ago, this discovery three months ago has altered the theories relative to how water came to be here on our planet. It is now believed that approximately three and a half billion years ago, there was a great bombardment on our planet Earth in its early stages of formation. And this great bombardment, now again, we did not have an atmosphere yet, so there's nothing to stop the meteors and comets from coming and slamming into our Earth. But during this great bombardment, comets, asteroids, and meteors delivered water here on Earth. And we have proof of this great bombardment because when we look at our moon, the face of our moon, we see all of these craters, craters that are no longer being made 
today, no longer being created at this time in history. So we know there was a great bombardment. So now that we've discovered this water that matches the water in the oceans of our Earth, we now in theory believe that it was because of comets, meteors, and asteroids that the water was delivered here to our planet Earth. And along the way, what did they bring? They brought along amino acids, the nucleobasis for life. Again, this is only a theory, but it is the latest theory. And this, again, drives home the importance for this new definition of Earth's water cycle, because we're getting water from outer space, from comets and meteors and asteroids delivered early in our history and still to this very moment. Meteorites are delivering water, extraterrestrial water, to our planet Earth. Here we have a photograph of the aurora borealis. And this is an indication of the excitation of our atmosphere because of the influence of solar wind. Now, throughout history, until just recently, Humankind believed that all the water on Earth always remained constant and that because of gravity and other influences, the water always stayed the same. It was always the same quantity. And as you have just learned, that is not true. We have water that is delivered to our planet from meteorites and from passing comets. So we do have, in addition to the Earth's atmosphere of extraterrestrial water, even though it is in minute quantities at the present time, it is still water being delivered to Earth from the universe. Now, we also have learned in recent history that we lose water into space. Now, again, this isn't in large quantities, but in fact, it has been proven scientifically that we lose water into space. Now, this occurs for various reasons, but we have uplifting influences, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, tropical storms around the equator. We have volcanoes. And we have also the updrafts along mountain ranges. So there are various uplifting influences which push our atmosphere up to the extremes, up into what we call the exosphere. And we call this the exosphere because we lose molecules to outer space. And the primary constituents of water, hydrogen and oxygen, are broken down into their primary ions and through the uplifting influences and because of the solar wind that you saw hitting the comet, the solar wind that hits our planet Earth, we lose water to space. Now, there are scientific minds that are really quite brilliant that have come up with a formula as to approximately how much water we lose to space each year. Water lost to space. Current science estimates that 5 times 10 to the 11th power grams of Earth's water is lost to space each year. The total amount of water lost to space since the beginning of our Earth's history comes to about 2 times 10 to the 21st power grams of water lost each year to space, or about 0.2% of water in all of Earth's oceans. Recent discoveries, however, over the past year indicate that our Earth is losing about a ton of atmosphere 
which includes hydrogen, oxygen ions, and other constituents, to outer space every hour. Now, as explained in the beginning of this presentation, this is the first time in history that this new definition of the water cycle is being made available to the public and revealing how our water cycle is made up of three interactive water cycles. Again, we have the cosmic water cycle, whereby we have extraterrestrial water coming to our planet Earth, and also whereby we are losing water to outer space. Then we have the atmospheric water cycle that is driven by the heat of our sun, whereby we have evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and collection. And then we have the oceanic water cycle, where all the water in Earth's oceans is circulated down to the core of our Earth and creates a new ocean, a new body of water, approximately every seven million years. Here we have, for the first time, an illustration that depicts the new definition for Earth's waterway cycle. What we have here is the cosmic water cycle, where we receive extraterrestrial water from the universe and where we lose water to space. Here we have the atmospheric water cycle with evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and collection. And here we have the oceanic water cycle where all the water in Earth's oceans are recycled and where we receive a new ocean approximately every seven million years. And these three cycles are interactive, the oceanic cycle, the atmospheric cycle, and the cosmic water cycle. These all three interact with each other. So here you have, for the first time, an illustration and the information giving you a new definition for Earth's waterway cycle. So I'd like to thank you for taking this water journey with me today. And oftentimes, after giving this presentation before audiences, people will come up to me and they'll say, William, I can never really look at the ocean with the same eyes. People that say this to me are usually like sailors or people who are around water a lot or people that fly over the ocean, like airline pilots, for instance, or scientists that work with satellites, that do exploratory work in our oceans. So we have an ocean, a new ocean every seven million years. And they cannot, when they see the ocean, they say, William, I now look at our ocean and I can actually feel, I can see it, that it's recycling to the core of our Earth. And other people say, you know, when I see shooting stars, our meteors in the night sky, now I'm thinking that they're delivering extraterrestrial water to our Earth every day. So it is my hope that by presenting this new definition for our Earth's waterway cycle, that it will be something that will be taught to school children around the world and to adults so that we can move forward with a new vision of how we ourselves can interact responsibly with Earth's waterway cycle. Now, part of this presentation was the artistic component. And for this part of the presentation, I have composed a poem relative to this new definition of the waterway cycle, as well as a Native American flute song that also 
connects with the new definition for our Earth's waterway cycle. In the poem, I'll read to you. It's a poem that I call The Waterway. How apropos. It's a poem that I wrote a couple of years ago while doing the research to create the definition for this new waterway cycle. The waterway. Our waterway cycles definition over 430 years ago was first found. Now we have new information that truly does astound. This new definition of the waterway cycle tells the story of how three interactive phenomena circulate water in ways most profound. Of how the oceanic cycle creates a new ocean every seven million years. Of how our ocean waters flow deep, deep, deep down to the core where they are heated and cycled around and around and around and around. Where superheated water vents up into our oceans. Where superheated water vents up into our continents. Steaming volcanoes and earthquakes too, all vital to life, including to me and to you. This new definition we call the waterway cycle also tells water's story with a new cosmic angle of how our water is lost to outer space, of how cosmic rain falls onto this sacred place, of how our waterway cycle is an open system connecting us with our Creator's infinite universe. So we may embrace our waters with divine wisdom in our actions, prose, music, and poetic verse. Now that poem encapsulates the new waterway cycle definition. And as the poem expresses, we would have no life on Earth today without the interaction of these three water cycles. Now I'm going to present to you the Native American flute song called Waterway Sunrise. That is made of a video that I took from behind my home here on Martha's Vineyard as the clouds of the early morning carrying water vapor from evaporation from our earth connect with the early morning rising sun, thus the name of this flute song called Waterway Sunrise. I give thanks to my Native American flute teacher, R. Carlos Nakai, for his inspiration. Certainly, throughout history, the Native American flute was used by Native Americans in their water rituals and in communicating with water. This flute song, which you're about to hear, is called Waterway Sunrise. And behind me, you will see a video that I took here on Martha's Vineyard of clouds during an early morning sunrise. This flute song is representative of the new waterway cycle definition. 
And during this flute song, by the way, this is the exact same flute song that I played at the United Nations when I gave a water presentation and at the National Geographic International Water is Life production that launched their new water book called Written in Water, in which I am one of the authors. So as I play the flute, you will hear high notes that represent the rain, the cosmic rain, and the cosmic water cycle. You will hear mid notes that represent the atmospheric water cycle, long mellow notes that represent the calm waters of our earth. You will hear rapid notes called rapidamente that represent the rapids of our flowing rivers and the turbulence in our Earth's oceans. You will hear deep notes that represent the waters that go deep, deep under our Earth and recycle new water to our oceans every seven million years. And you will also hear explosive notes that represent the volcanoes and the earthquakes of our Earth. So please, take a moment, sit back, take a deep breath, close your eyes, and take this journey with me, waterway, sunrise.
Thank you, my water brothers and sisters. May your earthly journey be blessed with clean, healthy waters as you journey in this water world. Thank you. <laughs>